The crucial Russia-Ukraine grain deal has been extended by a couple of months, bringing some relief to negotiators grappling with rising global food prices and therefore food insecurity. What pushed the deal over the line and how long will it last? China is hosting the first summit uh, with its five Central Asian neighbours, a region long considered China Russia's backyard. Why is this emerging regional grouping important and have the two major regional powers, Russia and China that is, uh, figured out something the West hasn't? that regional peace and cooperation is important to everyone's interests. And in the United States, Bernie Sanders is attempting a new legislation that will inject 200 billion US dollars into the ailing healthcare system. Does the plan have the potential to fix what is broken? And equally importantly, will the progressive bill pass through a divided house? You're watching Daily Debrief uh, from People's Dispatch, coming to you from our studios in New Delhi. I'm Siddhant Ani, and first up on the show, Ukraine. Uh, where two months have been extended uh, in the deal that was brokered between the United Nations, Turkey, Russia and Ukraine to allow grain exports out of the country, ostensibly uh, to allow some of the poorest and most needy in terms of food insecurity nations in the world to access food grain at affordable prices. Russia, of course, has objected to several aspects, had uh, objected to several aspects of how uh, the deal has been played out uh, since much of Ukraine's export actually ended up going to Europe instead of the countries that were supposedly uh, in the most need. But despite the obstacles after the intervention of Turkey uh, as well, uh, the deal has been extended for a short two-month period. Uh, Dr. Abdul Rahman joins us now with more details on what, how this process went down and what the future might hold. Abdul, uh, let's talk about the good part first. Russia had objections. Uh, you can maybe uh, sort of list out those objections for us and also how uh, diplomatically were they managed to sort of overcome those differences to make sure that at least in the very short term for a couple of months, uh, this grain deal is extended, has been extended. Well, uh, Russia had a very clear uh, position on the Green Deal since the first day when it was signed that the deal should, uh, of course, should be mutual in the nature that if Ukrainian grain is allowed, uh, since Russia is under sanction by the US and uh, European countries, it should also have the uh, uh, similar uh, uh, freedom to export its grain. Mm -hmm. And all those restrictions, which basically uh, hamper the transaction of uh, money uh, in return of the uh, grain exported, should be relaxed when it comes to uh, Russia. So this, mm -hmm. this was the primary, uh, uh, you can say, give and take on which Russia had agreed to allow the Ukrainian deal, uh, considering the larger issue of uh, food insecurity, increasing food insecurity at the global level and rising uh, in the prices of uh, the food grains, particularly impacting the poorer nations in Africa yeah. uh, and uh, in Asia. Uh, so from that was one concern, of course. The second concern emerges from this, that the grain should reach the countries which basically need them the most. But if you see the data, which, which, which was uh, Russia has basically raised the issue again and again, that uh, our, our, out of the 30 million uh, uh, metric tons of grain which has been exported since the deal was signed last year mm. uh, half more than half of it have have gone to uh, european countries or turkey uh, it means that the grain is not reaching the poorer african nations which basically were the reason behind russia well, allowing uh, the export of the grains at the first place so these two uh, were the primary concerns which russia has raised apart from the first the the, uh, the rising concerns about uh, green deal being misused to kind of create uh, different kinds of uh, interest here and there and there are dangers of smuggling of women weapon through those ships which are passing through so if, if you see the data the the the, uh, the number of searches on the way uh, on the ships which were passing through uh, uh, turkey's uh, sea uh, lines mm. had, had sea waters have in, had increased tremendously in the last few months, uh, uh, but given the concern that this is basically used to uh, smuggle weapons. So these were the primary concerns uh, because of which Russia has basically 
was not very willing to extend the Green Deal. But finally, it seems because of the interventions made by Turkish uh, president and by the UN uh, Secretary General, the deal has finally come through. Yeah. Uh, the multiple angles on, on this, Abdul, that we could talk further about. Unfortunately, we're uh, limited on time. So, uh, let's look at it in the context maybe of the G7 summit where at least reports indicate that uh, a tighter set of sanctions will be put in place. Uh, how, how does that factor into the longevity of this deal? Because at some point Russia is naturally going to turn around and say on the one hand you have evidence of what looks like grain for weapons. Uh, and on the other you are restricting our ability to export food grains to not to your countries but to those uh, countries that really need them i mean and there are several of them around the world like you were mentioning exactly so if you see the statements made by the us uh, and its allies in europe after russia uh, uh, basically agreed for the extension of the deal and the ukrainian ministers of course say alleging russia that uh, it is using the grain for uh, basically uh, as a weapon uh, uh, against the Ukrainians and to get basically to get certain uh, relaxations vis-a-vis uh, -vis the sanctions uh, imposed by European Union and US. So they are, they, they are making those allegations on the one hand, but on the, on the same, they are uh, expecting the Russians to basically agree to allow the export of the grain. Uh, without any conditions. Mm. So uh, it seems that there is no war going on. When they talk about uh, this deal, it seems there is no war going on. There is no uh, disagreement, strategic or whatever, uh, about the uh, uh, overall situation in Eastern Europe. There mm. is no NATO in it. There is no uh, a threat of nuclear uh, ex escalation and all. And uh, and, uh, and in, uh, they expect in Russia to basically forget all of this and just let the trade happen normal. Yeah. But there, and no sanctions, by the way. That is the most important thing. There are no sanctions on Russians. So this particular way of putting things, uh, you're talking about G7. Uh, G7, is, as you rightly pointed out, is thinking about new set of sanctions against Russians. Uh, and on the on one hand, they're talking about all these things that they will do whatever they are doing, continue to do it uh, against Russia and put sanctions supply more weaponry to trade, uh, try to block uh, whatever, even the Russian athletes, Russian artists, and so on and so forth. But Russia should not have any uh, 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 opinion, uh, should not express any concerns that it is expected to make certain concessions. So this particular way, and uh, it seems if you read the reports by uh, in the international media like AP and other, they're expressing this particular perspective of the US and other things, uh, other countries uh, involved in this. And that basically speaks uh, volumes about how hypocritically they have approached to the larger issue uh, of uh, uh, which basically has been the center of this particular conflict in the region, which is uh, uh, the security uh, uh, concerns of Russian security concerns and the expansion of Europe. I think the UN also will be quite deeply concerned uh, looking at all of these aspects, uh, particularly for what happens after this two-month period. And uh, I, I guess negotiations, this dialogue will continue on this subject in this period. So uh, hopefully something can be worked out, but uh, we we'll wait to see what happens at the end of the G7 summit and, and what, how, what implications that has. Because at least Reuters, like you were pointing out, Reuters was reporting, uh, Abdul, that um, all items that are not on uh, already cleared list, approved list, will automatically be considered under sanctions. So that's likely to make life uh, a lot more difficult uh, in most regards. All right, thanks very much for your time. China's President Xi Jinping is hosting in the central city, uh, city of Xi'an uh, the first ever summit with leaders of five Central Asian nations. This, of course, is a reiteration of Beijing's growing influence in the region, uh, along with Russia, which has long been a major player. The two-day event brings together China, of course, along with Kazakhstan, Kyrgy the Kyrgyz Republic, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan and Uzbekistan. These countries are all critical 
to China's uh, Belt and Road Initiative. It's being held in the city that was once that was once the starting point of the fabled Silk Road. We examine what the importance of uh, this summit is and the context in which it's happening. Anish, the temperatures in the, this part of the world are uh, heating up and so is summit season uh, on all sides. Uh, a new sort of uh, regional conversation is happening in China uh, being hosted by uh, Xi Jinping uh, where uh, China is talking to five Central Asian countries. Uh, of course, in the context of uh, the G7 uh, summit that is also coming, uh, the encirclement that is going on of China on that side, uh, this is in many ways uh, an interesting uh, summit to talk about from a regional trade and cooperation perspective. What are the highlights uh, that you are seeing? Well, for China, it is essentially uh, an expression of its friendly friendly relations with some of its very old allies. Uh, we need to remember that uh, all of these countries that China is having talks with uh, were uh, former Soviet republics, and obviously they've had, they've held uh, extensive, uh, extensively friendly relations for decades now with China, in the manner in, it, with, uh, in which it exists today as the People's Republic of China, obviously. And so there is uh, that legacy. Uh, apart from that, there is the fact that uh, the Belt and Road Initiative obviously requires the Central Asian uh, landmass to be a central focus, in fact, the pivotal focus yeah. uh, for the project to expand and be uh, and have a stable working environment as well. Uh, mm. uh, and uh, to, if it wants to extend to, say, the Indian Ocean or uh, the Persian Gulf and uh, all the other places that it is now trying to expand into, so definitely, uh, Central Asia uh, is uh, quite valuable to China at this point. It is also, we need to remember, one of those places that uh, the West has very often neglected to uh, see as maybe some potential or uh, geostrategically potential allies uh, in the coming future. Uh, so obviously, China is taking that stand where it is treating these countries with the a level of respect uh, it requires to treat them with so that they can be on their side when it comes to trade and economic initiatives that China is trying to push into mm. the region. Mm. Uh, we, which uh, perhaps leads to the scary prospect in the near future of the US actually taking an interest in the region and it doesn't work out too well quite often. Uh, but, but maybe you can touch on that a little bit. But also, also uh, there has been some talk of uh, drama where necessarily none exists because Russia and China have managed to cooperate quite well uh, in terms of um, ensuring sort of stability and, and uh, generally peace in a region that is otherwise, you know, has many, uh, many people or players trying to stir up trouble in the broader uh, sense. So... Uh, what, how does Russia fit into this dynamic between China and uh, the Central Asian countries? Uh, and, and is it like a, a sort of regional grouping that will, you think, continue to cooperate, continue to work towards uh, common aims, particularly when it comes to trade and, and things like that? Well, that's an interesting question because obviously we've already seen uh, headlines that try to center Russia as, uh, uh, you know, a focal point in the summit when it is not the case. Uh, we need to remember that uh, along with Russia, all these countries that, the China, that China is meeting with today in Beijing uh, are also part of the SEO, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And so they are not necessarily uh, in uh, competitive planes in many ways, because obviously for China, if it wants to expand its BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, it really requires Russia as well as the Central Asian economies. And uh, I think the problem is with how uh, a lot of mainstream media views uh, smaller countries or you know uh, developing countries as uh, you know blocks of spheres of influence that certain bigger nation would want yeah. to encroach upon and that is really not how China is trying to deal with uh, uh, be it uh, Central Asia or for instance uh, but what we saw recently with the Pacific Islands 
or uh, much back in time in the 2000s when we saw uh, China, uh, in, you know, becoming a bigger player, bigger economic trade uh, partner in the African continent. Mm. And so in all of these cases, uh, China has extended on a more or less diplomatic relationship. Uh, it did not really intervene in their politi- uh, you know, politics. It did not comment on its uh, domestic issues either. It sought stability. It sought friendly relations and you know, sovereign to sovereign relations. And this is something similar that it is doing. Uh, with Central Asia as well. Now, obviously, it is becoming a focus primarily because of, as I said, the kind of initiatives that it wants to expand when it wants to use the land route to Europe, for instance, uh, to expand its trade uh, uh, or its markets, for instance. And uh, obviously, the, uh, these countries cannot be avoided uh, for those uh, matters. And in uh, in the longer run, obviously, we can definitely see some kind of um, intervention in that sense by the West. But the manner, if you look at how uh, the West starts, suddenly started taking interest in Pacific Islands and compare that with if the West starts taking interest in Central Asia, it is going to be different because in the Pacific Islands, there were always uh, certain very conservative right-wing governments that have always sided with the U.S. and its allies. In the cent- Central Asian region, that was never the case. In fact, many of these countries have been disregarded as uh, sort of like oriental despots. Mm-hmm. And uh, the kind of treatment that they really get uh, from the West, from Europe, uh, or from uh, the United States is basically of, uh, you know, sort of ir- irrelevant uh, authoritarian governments that do not really require that much attention. And that's how they treat them very often. So it will be very interesting how the U.S. and the West tries to overturn that. And that can al- always become a problem because they can always talk about how they will be supporting democratic initiatives and stuff like that in the region. So we'll need to wait and see. But at this point, obviously, the waiting stand, China has the upper hand. And obviously, its friendly relations with Russia is going to help in expanding its, uh, if not, I don't want to say sphere of influence, but obviously, it's uh, uh, already existing relations in the region in a much more broader uh, sense with a more a bigger volume of sort of, say trade and services and other sort of uh, uh, outflow of uh, all sorts of economic activities from the region as well. Mm. Trade, for example, up close to forty percent over a very short period. So, so obviously a, a lot more possible in terms of cooperation on those fronts. Thanks, Anish, uh, for those updates, and and, uh, we'll catch you very soon on Daily Debrief once again. And finally, on the back of sustained actions from healthcare workers since the pandemic, it has finally been recognized that understaffing is a major issue in the United States' healthcare sector. Now, Independent Senator Bernie Sanders is attempting to build political consensus on a bold new plan that will inject a new $130 billion into community healthcare centers and $60 billion on funding and growing the healthcare workforce in the United States over a five year period. The plan seeks to address working conditions, including pay scales, of course, as well as massive understaffing, like I was mentioning, and is the next hope to fix a broken system that has left America, the richest country in the world in a situation where many still don't have access to critical health care. On the way, of course, the legislation is contending with lobbying and the profit motive of large hospitals as well as other private health care providers in that country. Anna Vrachar of the People's Health Movement joins us with the latest. Anna, if you can start by uh, maybe giving our audience a bit of context into what's been going on in uh, as far as health care workers in the United States are concerned over the past couple of years. Essentially, uh, since uh, the end of 2022, uh, groups of health workers in the U.S., uh, with nurses taking the leading role, I would say, uh, have embarked on a series of of, uh, strikes and of uh, protests of uh, different kinds of action, uh, which address both the bad working conditions that they were facing, but also the staffing levels that are a concrete p- consequence of the ongoing uh, health work uh, workers shortage in uh, in the country. And so one of the most notable examples that we can remember, of course, is the nurses strike in Minnesota. At the end of 2022, uh, the nurses held a very successful strike, uh, which uh, dealt with uh, all these kind of problems that we usually talk about here. So, you know, it's uh, 
uh, inadequate pay for a lot of work. Uh, it's uh, irregular working hours. It's a lot of working time. Uh, and what the Minnesota nurses cho cho uh, chose to do was also to talk about uh, issues re regarding safe, safe staffing. Uh, one of the results of their action was uh, a proposal for an act, which is called the Keeping Nurses at the Bedside Act. Uh, it's an interesting p uh, proposal uh, of uh, of legislation because uh, it's actually shaped by health workers, by nurses themselves. Uh, and its main uh, point is to uh, include nurses in the decision-making process uh, and in essentially in monitoring uh, working conditions in hospitals uh, to ensure that there are enough health workers to care for the number of patients that, uh, that uh, the hospital is seeing. So uh, this act has been rallied by nurses uh, over the last uh, almost half a year now. Uh, and among other things, it inclu includes a provision uh, which, uh, which creates commissions uh, where nurses uh, essentially uh, follow what is going on and they can have the space to say if they feel that the, sta uh, the staffing staffing situation in the hospital is ina inadequate and might be harmful to patients. Right, and considering the scale of the problem, is it something that can be resolved at the state level or is it essential uh, to have this kind of federal uh, intervention, Anna? Uh, judging from the latest news and what's being talked about most intensively these days, uh, it seems that Senator Bernie Sanders uh, is actually taking or at least is trying to take uh, significant steps steps towards uh, improving the healthcare system in the US, which is, uh, we all know by now, uh, a criminal thing. So since he took chairing over the Health Education and Labor Committee, uh, Sanders uh, has proposed a series of things uh, to strengthen the health system, to make it more accessible to people, and to protect the health workers who, um, who, who are staffing it. Uh, the most recent proposal would see around $200 billion being invested in uh, in healthcare. It's a massive amount, of course. Uh, and what's important in this is uh, to note uh, where uh, he's suggesting that the money should go. Uh, most of it would go in community healthcare system or primary healthcare system, uh, which is very important because we know that this is the level of healthcare uh, where most people... Uh, get the care they need. If this level of healthcare is organized in the right way, if it's staffed in the right way, if it's financed in the right way, there's a better chance of people getting treated for what they're suffering from. And then in addition to that, uh, the plan is for seeing uh, some $60 billion um, dollars being allocated to the health workforce alone. So that would include, you know, not only employing more people, but also training, uh, Yes, training locally and uh, essentially addressing all these problems that health workers have been pointing out throughout throughout the past couple of years. Uh, one of the most inter interesting parts uh, of the plan, in addition to, <laughs> to the amount that uh, the committee is asking for, um, and of course, the amount is such that is it's already causing raised uh, eyebrows all around because we know that you know in uh, high income countries especially in the US especially in Europe uh, so uh, legislators are quite uh, not keen to invest in health or education but would rather spend the money on something else um this put aside uh, what's interesting in the plan that the committee is putting forward is that it's actually trying to address some uh, some of the existing and widespread inequities that are there in the in the health healthcare system in the U.S. Uh, and I'm not talking only about you know how accessible healthcare is uh, to people who live in rural areas, for example, who are most often cut off from the from the uh, all, uh, from the network, uh, but also of uh, about the way that the health system is formed and it's trained, it's built. So uh, one of the points that uh, that Sanders made during uh, when he announced this plan is that um, it should include a plan of how to of training a health workers uh, a workforce which is not representative exclusively of the white middle class in the U.S. Uh, this is a very big problem at the moment because we know that you know. Um, 
the structure of of the workforce can also impact health outcomes for different for different groups so for example black people or uh, uh, as essentially, the Black community in the U.S. Uh, is underrepresented in the health workforce trained uh, in the in the United States, uh, and it, it means that the healthcare is essentially less uh, less straightforward and less uh, less there for uh, for the people in the community. That's a wrap for this episode of the Daily Debrief from Anna, myself, and the entire team here at People's Dispatch. Thank you very much, as always for watching. Uh, we encourage you to head to our website peoplesdispatch.org for all of the work we do and details on these stories of course are there as well. Uh, you can also follow us on the social media platform of your choice for regular updates. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Until then, stay safe. Goodbye.